Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 439. That's 439 of the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? Good? Good. Amazing. Great to know. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, turn on your notification bell, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, download the show, share it with your friend, put it on the back of an envelope, stick it on the back of your shoe, do all you can to promote it via the podcast. That would be great and helpful for me to climb up the charts and get some coverage, you know, and slowly but surely maybe get some of that sweet sponsorship money, yo. But before then, you could also sponsor... Or also back the show via Patreon. Patreon.com for watches Agostino to get exclusive bonus episodes on Patreon. Some more, you know, risque topics. Topics I probably want, don't want to put out there into the universe out on YouTube. So make sure if you want to see that extra bonus content, another one's going out. At the end of the week, it's going to be two of those bonus shows per week on Patreon for my Patreon subscribers only. And you can subscribe on Patreon for as little as $1. Equivalent of £1 on Patreon only. You can subscribe and get access to these bonus shows two a week on Patreon at Patreon.com. Fortress Agostino. That is patreon.com forces Agostino. Don't be a tight son of a and get involved, all right? Help a, help the boy out. Look what look what I'm doing. I'm drinking cold brew coffee, trying to keep awake, right? I've got my glasses, I'm hiding the pain behind my eyelids. Get involved on Patreon. Make this guy smile again or patreon.com forces Agostino. You've been warned. You've been warned. Okay, we are back. Episode number 439. I hope you are ready to go and to pod wherever you may be. So many stuff to talk about. So many things. So many stuff. Why do sometimes... Why do I have occasions? Why do sometimes... Why do I have instances where I sound like an African uncle? Huh? Why is it? Why am I unable to formulate my words? What is wrong with me? Maybe it's the lack of reading. I haven't been reading as much as I should be, actually. I usually try and read a book. Well, I, really try and, I usually try and read four books a month, which is an hour a day. Sometimes I bump up to two. This time around, I've probably been getting away with maybe half an hour here and there i need to get back to reading reading the readers i in my opinion it helps to um sharpen your comprehension and also helps to kind of improve your vocabulary i'm not sure how that happens don't ask me i'm not that smart but somehow reading especially if you're not even reading aloud just reading to yourself um tends to really help me stop my um dependency on run-on sentences on grammatical mistakes and you know uh pronunciation errors i don't know what it does i don't know why that happens but it has a really powerful mystic um uh force that ends up you know ends up you tightening all of your vocabulary and as you can see i need tightening i need tightening you know no is that a pause maybe who knows who cares no one's around right can't pause yourself anyway what's going on man what's going on i'm good i'm feeling good thank you for asking what am i doing right now i'm drinking a cold brew thinking about life oh actually i've been really pumped and looking forward to the gym you know there's so much good music that's dropped lately i've not really had a chance to really enjoy it because there's no gym like oddly enough in it you you forget maybe this has been a reminder for all of us but you forget just how important such you know uh, minute things are to your overall uh, quality of life right so as maybe the gym i don't spend that much time in it right as opposed to everything else i do in my day i'm there for what an hour maybe an hour and a half max sometimes if you do a double session it's two hours but still not that much time but if you think about it in terms of framing music you i tend to listen to a lot more new albums and just stuff music in general because i'm having to put together a playlist i'm having to download those favorite albums or songs that i want to listen to when i go to the gym then i'm walking to the gym which is another 10 15 minutes then i'm training then i'm walking back home or maybe taking a detour to go to the shops continued listening to some music then i'm listening to that music when i come back home and i'm in the shower then i'm listening to that music later when i'm having some dinner like i'm listening to it do you know what i mean i'm i'm it, it kind of frames my entire day and then who knows because i've been re-listening to somebody's tune or listening to somebody's new record i might then be like oh actually are they playing anytime soon in london boom check it out they've got a show now i'm buying a ticket so it's really changed the entire experience of listening and i'm sure artists have definitely felt that they definitely felt i would assume as counterintuitive as this sounds because most people would argue oh no you're indoors so I mean, most people are listening to music but i think it's the opposite i actually think it's happening is that most people are probably listening to less because they don't have the um avenue or the outlet of going out that um 
usually I would I would kind of use the example of like um train as like training in martial arts, right? But a lot of people say if you train in any kind of self defense, that it's really good for your mind, ment- your mind, body, and soul because it helps you to kind of get out that little bit of aggressive aggressive energy that you have during the week or during your day. Right, you kind of have an outlet to kind of you know um, take it out on something, a partner that you're aspiring with, a heavy bag, whatever. And we don't have that without the freedoms of going outdoors. We don't have clubs, we don't have bars, so you can't get out that kind of you know devious, um, going outery sort of vibe that you want to. You know, it's hard. You can't get it out. Do you know what I mean? It, it just, it just. I don't know. I've just noticed it. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I've noticed. I've definitely decrease in my amount of music even the stuff i've been trying to put together for mixes and stuff like i listen to stuff here and there but it's just not the same you know what i mean it's not the same like sometimes my entire week or sometimes the entire month will be framed around a particular event i was going to a rave or this or whatever a gig a showcase a, uh you know a record launch sometimes if you were to phonic and that kind of stuff your entire week would be f- framed around maybe you know Especially if it was a gig of an artist I haven't listened to it in a while. It'll be kind of going through the discography, re-listening to old stuff, picking out stuff that you like, that you're looking forward to, maybe seeing live, maybe watching some clips of the other performances. Like, it all was part of it. And now it's a little bit difficult. But that being said, you know, the new um, Drake EP came out. Is it EP or is it a little... It's a little... It's a little... Yeah, it's a little EP. EP's more than four, in it? So it's not an EP, but he put out a little pack to keep the streets fed. Um, it's called Scary I Was 2. It's pretty decent. Um, the first track, I'm sure we heard already because it came out as a leak. You know, prior to COVID, I wasn't a big leak person. I tend to kind of wait for albums to come out. But, you know, with the lack of going outdoors, the only thing you have to look forward to is listening to music you're not meant to listen to. So I listen to leaks now. So I heard that. Um, the track of Little Baby goes, you know, is, is really good. Little Baby fucking delivers absolutely kills that track and then you've got the track with rick ross and drake i don't think there's they've ever have a track together where it kind of flatters to deceive or it doesn't maybe meet your kind of criteria of pleasure it's just so good they have such a great combo in it drake and rick ross the only thing i'd say as a criticism is that maybe the rick ross verse is a little bit too short the track is like six minutes 50 and it's mostly drake just going off but i would like maybe to have heard rick ross have a you know a longer verse maybe do you know half and half that would be pretty good um yeah that's really decent and then what else I've oh and then um Tory Lanez has got a uh, Tory Lanez has got a little project that he put out too I'm gonna say it's an album because it's about 10 tracks I think it's 12 let me say it's 12 it's called Loverboy or Playboy is it Loverboy Playboy what is it called Da, 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 da. I've got it here on my list. Let me get rid of this albums. It's called Playboy. It's really good, man. Really, really good. It's a real shame with Tory Lanez. Again, I was never the biggest fanatical fan of Tory Lanez. I think I've I've seen him perform live once, and I wasn't that impressed. It was pretty bad, to be fair. But again, I don't know if that was just at each stage of his career, and because of the stage itself, you know, it was essentially an arena. This is when Future came and performed in London here at the O2. And Tory Lanez was one of his opening acts, um, along with Rich the Kid and a few other people. I forgot. No, Rich the Kid was was Travis, wasn't it? Anyway, I remember he was performing on that stage. That uh, Future, ha- no, he's performing at the. Was it Future or Travis Scott? Was Future, wasn't it? I think it was Future. Or was it Travis Scott? It might have been Travis Scott. Regardless, was that the O2? I remember him. It might have been Travis Scott. Actually, that was weird. Wow. So they must have made up. So he was performing. If you remember, Travis Scott had this mad um, stage design. Where it was like a. Uh, it was similar to what Drake did, where he had like a massive box that was basically uh, a screen that you could project stuff onto or you could project stuff out of regardless of how it worked. Um, and Tory Lanez was performing on it and it wasn't really good. Um, that way he sings and that style, it probably doesn't really work that well for that big of an arena. The sound kind of just lose, kind of gets, kind of evaporates in the atmosphere and it kind of sounds a little bit weird, high frequency. But I'd imagine if he's performing like he is crooning on a song in like a you know, a 500 cap, you know, arena, a 500 cap venue, 1000 maybe cap venue. I think he would sound incredible. But that aside, um, just a shame, isn't it, that he's putting out such great music. Like he, he put out this uh, album called Loverboy that I like. Then he put, I'm sorry, called Playboy, Loverboy. Then he's got another one called Loner. I think it's like a, I think they're like a two pack. I'm imagining they're, t- they're a thing he does together. I'm not too sure, but they're really good, right? Really, really good. Front to back, like great R&B, um, amazing singing, good melodies, great beat selection, productions all over, productions like all over the place, but in a good way. 
um, really interesting kind of ideas, you know, that he's kind of um, experimenting with in terms of flows and whatever it may be, and melodies, as mentioned previously. But no one's given him any kind of looks because of the whole Megan Thee Stallion situation, right? Did he shoot her? Did he not shoot her? Was it him? Was it not him? Um, what actually occurred in a car, no one knows. And we're in a situation now where it's like, what? It's been like a year. Has it been a year? It might have been a year. I think it was during COVID, isn't it? So it might. It feels like, it feels like it's a year. Is it a year? I'm not too sure if it is. It might be less than a year. But regardless, right? It feels like we've been living with this for ages, and we still haven't got any sort of resolution as to what exactly occurred. No one's talking. No one's really being open about what actually happened. Everyone's kind of keeping mum apart from Megan, who kind of categorically said, no, he did it. There's no confusion. He was the guy. She pointed at him, said his name, even after, you know, I think she said his name maybe in the third or fourth video she put out. The first time she kind of skirted around it, but then she directly said, no, you shot me. You know you did, blah, blah, blah. But he adamantly denies it. And I don't know, man. I think considering what's at stake, considering how hip-hop has treated other men who have been violent towards women especially ones who aren't grandfathered in because you know you think of somebody that fabulous and stuff right allegedly he must have knocked his girlfriend's his wife or mother's child's teeth out that's what we allege happened on those shade room blogs and nothing really happened to the situation right he kind of went quiet for a bit came back and everything's fine they're now like a happy family on social media but he didn't really have to face any like consequences so there is a, obviously a bit of a hypocritical thing going on or more so just a different you know treatment for people i guess that's what you get if you're fabulous and you've had what 20 plus years in hip-hop you may be that's part of the perks of being a legend in the game sometimes some things happen and they're serious but because you're a legend you, you're allowed to kind of ride it and continue on it might just be part of the game who knows but it's still odd to me that we have two people who have different accounts of one incident incident sorry that occurred traumatic of course but two wildly different perspective on what exactly happened and one person is able to kind of thrive right Megan Thee Stallion's got everything has been given to her lately since the obviously the shooting whether it's for sympathy or whether it's because of artistry who knows who cares it's not worth um, debating at the moment but essentially she's been able to just continue and carry on prosper of course you know doing her initiatives in terms of you know protecting black women and all this sort of stuff like she's been able to really thrive off the back of it but anytime tori speaks on it mentions it in a song which i'm not really a fan of personally but i get it you know your artistry is your platform to basically um you know pr express yourself as you see fit and what better way to express yourself about something so traumatic than sing about it i think that'd be a great way to deal with that kind of trauma if it's that such a if it's such a situation if this is a serious situation as we expect think it is the music is probably the best platform to basically get your feelings across because it's hard maybe to kind of articulate yourself in a really cogent way you know speaking into camera or on a podcast or whatever just maybe a bit difficult but it's just odd that he seems to be the one that has to put his career on pause when we don't know what happened no one's it's, it's it'll be different if it was like okay the court has judged the court has ruled Tory shot the girl you go into prison for a bit you take a fine then, i don't know whatever then fair but because no one knows what's happened they have two different accounts of the situation from what from if you look at it really closely ever since that situation all of megan's closest friends at that time have fallen out with her she's for, who knows why it's, if it's because of her with Tory. we don't know we don't know she has different friends she has a whole new boyfriend now it's just odd. It's just odd. So it's a bit out of order. Do you know what I mean? People don't get to listen to his stuff with an objective eye because obviously in their heads they think he did what he did. Or he did what he's being alleged of doing. And then with Megan, she also has another thing over her as well because people don't they tend to give her the credit that she might deserve because they say, oh, you're only getting the credit because you got shot. So it's a really bad situation to be in for all involved. Um, as per usual with these sort of things, no one really wins. Even if it does get ruled that Megan lied or if it gets ruled that Tori did shoot her, no one wins. She's had to have this whole thing over her head for a, more than a year, as has he. Um, he loses his career or loses momentum, loses your industry contact. Because that's a ba big thing I'd imagine, big. That's a big thing I'd imagine. I'd imagine it's not more so... Let's say he gets away with not going to prison because he's a celebrity and he ends up taking a plea deal. Let's say, let's just imagine a scenario. It's not exactly the fact that you're a plea deal is sort of like an admission of guilt. It's more so about what that does to your connections in the industry. Because I'd imagine a lot of the reason why some artists are as successful as they are has to do a lot to do with their artistry and their talent and their work ethic. Yeah, I understand. But also, wouldn't it wouldn't um, be a surprise to me 
if a lot of it has to do with who you know and the positions and the places that you're put in and the conversations you're a part of, where you record your stuff, um, who you go to promo it to, who's your PR, these things are really important. And I'd imagine instances like this, they won't be announced, right? No one will hear that you're not represented by this person or not represented. No one would hear that that person that is at that agency isn't returning your calls. No one would hear that that studio isn't allowing you to record there anymore. These will be things that are just on the kind of need to know basis in the industry but that is the kind of thing that's going to greatly affect your overall ability to make music right and make money um and tour and connect to your fans and shit so that's a bummer about it like regardless of what i think of the story in general no one would win you know Tory's album's coming out no one's talking about it on the timeline because no one wants to be you know accused of and being an enabler or co-signing you know somebody that might have done something really heinous to a woman like it's just a whole situation, whole madness. And again, like I said, with the with the Megan thing, every bit of success she gets, everyone says it's not real, it's not valid because she's just riding the protect all women, um, sort of like promotional hype train thing. No one really wins, unfortunately. But again, like I said, Tory Lane's album's out now. It's called Playboy. Check it out. It's really good. I enjoyed it. Um, for what it is, it's very very well put together. Next on the list we have, oh, we have this really mad, mad launch from SpaceX, isn't it? So SpaceX um, Starship SN, or Starship, SpaceX uh, Starship SN10. Um, this is the latest in prototypes that they are putting together in order to test if this way of flying rockets is actually viable, right? If they can do this, you know, numerous times with these prototypes, they can maybe slowly um envisions a future where they're going to be able to send this uh spaceship to mars in order for us to maybe have a possibility at prolonging our lifespan and allowing us to basically relocate to another planet if we end up inevitably turning the planet we're on into cabbage or less cabbage coal right and um it worked to a certain extent as you can see here i'm going to play a bit of the liftoff video for you starship sn10 10 9 Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. We have lift off. Wow. It's lifting off now. It's so cool. Wow. SC2, please prepare for section. And you know how otherworldly that looks? Do you know how cool that might be? Honestly, like when I think of Starship and I think of everything SpaceX is doing, you know, from the flipping boosters that land by themselves and shit, right? And the, 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 we still haven't seen the super heavy, which is going to be the other bit that goes on the bottom of the Starship that is going to, you know, send up more fuel and propellant to Starship when it's out of orbit. It might legitimately be the coolest thing that we get to see day to day um, since the iPhone. Do you remember when the iPhone first was, you know, released and we first got a glimpse of, you know, Steve Jobs on the stage saying, it's a phone, an email and a music player, a phone, email, music player. And said, it's one thing together. And we saw this thing, oh my God. And it's got a screen you could touch. Before that, all you've seen is, you know, Sony phones with a stylist and whatever it may be. And those little foldable mini laptop things. It just blew your mind like, oh my God, this is a glimpse into the future. Like, wow, right? This is similar. This is so freaky. And I guess maybe because we're going through COVID, right? And we're sort of all in a bit of a funk and no one's really in the best of moods, it feels like. And everyone's basically more worried and preoccupied about ensuring that, you know, they don't catch this flipping godforsaken virus and making sure that they live to fight another day so that they can go back to living their normal lives, going on a holiday, hanging out with friends and all this sort of stuff. So people are not really focusing on these sort of things because it's quite, it might be a little bit, I guess some people will look at this and be like, oh, they're wasting their time and money into a, a spaceship that's only going to be viable and in, oh, yeah, viable in terms of being able to be, you know, used what, in the next decade or so, whilst we have some real-life concerns right now that we need to address. I get it. 
But in terms of just distracting yourself from the craziness going on in the world, because, you know, things are getting better. There's a vaccine in most places of the world. You have access to some vaccines. Whether or not you can get them is a whole other issue. Whether or not your government is set up to basically roll them out, who bloody knows? Because it sounds like, you know, except for New Zealand and Australia, everyone's doing a terrible job. But in terms of a pure distraction from the rigors of everyday life, this is fascinating to watch. This thing's like, what? Is it 14 stories high or something stupid like that? Plus a super heavy underneath it. It's going to be a, a gargantuan thing to just witness. And it's lifting itself, you know, on its own up to a certain altitude. Then it's turning off its engines, belly flopping, but uh, turning into a belly flop maneuver. Its flaps go inward so it can control itself. Um, and then it turns on a couple of engines to shoot itself back upright again and then lands. Like, are you insane? How ins are you? Do you realize how crazy that is? Like, it's absolutely crazy when you think about the conventional design of a space rocket or a spaceship, it's like you know, the, the shuttle or just you know, just a conventional missile looking thing, and you got this. Wow. 35 OSC FC1 LVN. T plus 30 seconds, Starship 10 has lift off. It's headed to 10 kilometers on its test flight from Boca Chica in Cameron County, Texas. This looks so cool, man. Look at that. That looks beautiful. See a little heat shields on the outside as well to, you know, so they can find out and test whether or not um, it's going to be able to re-enter the atmosphere easy without incinerating itself. Really is crazy. Let's fast forward a little bit and you can see where it turns off its engines. Let me see, where's that thing? Let's go up a little bit. Let's fast forward. It gets a certain attitude, it turns off all its engines and then just sort of like free falls. Four minutes, we're at 10 kilometers, we've gone into the hover, we're still being powered by the single Raptor engine. Wow, it's hovering now. How amazing is that? A bit. Oh, there you go. Oh, it's turned off the engines now, right? There. Oh, so cool. It's so cool. This is a proper dad boner, but look at that. Wow. Look at it. That is incredible. Incredible to look at. And this is the belly flop maneuver that's going to allow it to re-enter Mars atmosphere one day. Two plus four minutes and 40 seconds. Starship has transitioned. It's flipped to the horizontal mode, beginning the descent back to the landing zone. Wow. Look at that. Free falling. The flaps are pointed up to contr help control it. And I guess it's got some sort of vents on the side. That's what the little burst, right? That's kind of controlling its altitude, I'd imagine. Or kind of controlling its uh, where it kind of balances on the axis, I'd imagine, right? Is that it? Right? It's like tss, 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 those little bits. Wow. It's still going. We're down below two kilometers. We're preparing to light three Raptor engines to begin the flip sequence. It'll culminate with landing on the landing pad in Boca Chica. That sounds so cool. And now it's super free. Imagine being underneath that, like, oh my God. There we go. Engines reignite, back upright. One engine turns off. The legs come out. Still an engine, and then it kind of bounces. I think that's why it fucks up in it, right? Yeah, it does a little bounce. So it doesn't land the best, and then I think a few minutes later, it just all blows up. It's still on fire. Was to get. We had a non roll of the bed. We cut down two of them of Starship. Starship team and, and have delivered team has. Do you see flight. it here? No, you don't see 11. it. Okay, they they cut it off. But yeah, it does. It did end up blowing up in the end anyway. But that is pretty cool, man. I love seeing shit like that, honestly, man. It's good to kind of get your mind off of um, the daily uh, rigors of life in it going on at the moment with this sort of heady, heady stuff. Talking about daily rigors. 
you've got this flipping lovely gentleman in it. Good old Boris decided to give us a message about how to be healthy during COVID. <laughs> oh, sorry. When you consider, it's funny, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. God almighty. It's funny that Boris is saying this considering how... Um, how reckless he was in the beginning. Do you remember, right? This is honestly, this is honestly a really, really, really funny. Because if you remember in the beginning of COVID, he was one of those COVID denier guys, right? He didn't really take it too seriously. There was a famous clip of him going t on talking um, and basically saying that he's in hospital, shaking everyone's hands and shit. And of course, eventually he ended up getting it, nearly died so much. So yeah, nearly died, right? They were even um, putting together a plan, a succession plan in, if, in order, in case he did pass away. And then I guess because of that fright and because of how serious that was, he's now been put on some sort of workout diet regime. And he's now telling the great British public to, you know, stay healthy and ensure they don't eat any late night cheeses. And it's just, it's just funny, man. It's funny. It's another hilarious thing in our drama with COVID here in the UK. Let's play a bit of the video and see what Boris has to say. Hi folks, I've been doing a lot, in fact everything I can, to uh, lose weight and to feel uh, fitter and healthier. And the No homo though, he does look really good. He does look a lot slimmer in the face. You can definitely tell that, especially when he's talking on the, um, he's giving his um, daily briefings and shit. You could definitely tell from his neck and his face, he's definitely he's lost a lot of weight. I've been doing is I've been At least probably four stone, I'd say. Eating less Maybe uh, two. carbs, avoiding uh, chocolate no more late night cheese all that kind of thing i've been getting up early to go for for runs and the result is you know i actually have lost some weight uh, quite a lot by my uh, standards and um I, I feel much more energetic i feel uh, full of beans and i thoroughly thoroughly uh, recommend it i know there are many people who are in the same sort of position as i am and i was and who who want to lose weight and that's why we're investing now in uh the that whole national objective 100 million pounds to help people to access uh, gp appointments uh to get the right apps that they need to help them to to lose weight and uh we're also looking at various kind of fit miles schemes as well and what we want to do is to encourage another 700,000 people around the country who have the kind of problems uh, that I have had uh, to do the same thing. And so we'll be not just fitter, but also healthier and happier and we'll bounce back better together. That's the objective. Oh, fuck off. Now it's so it's bounce back better and build back better. This guy is a mug, isn't it? Open the gyms then, isn't it, if you want us to work out and be healthy again. I'm the fattest I've ever been because of the flipping non-access to gyms. That's a major part of what I'm telling myself. <laughs> anyway, but no, honestly, I'm the fattest I've ever been because of the non-access to gyms. In our current plan, we have the pubs being open, able to serve people um, takeaways, but you can't go to a gym and work out. So you can get a drink and get plastered with your friends outside, but you can't go and lift a couple of dumbbells, run in a running machine, swing a kettlebell around a bit, get a need for squat rack. Come on, man. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And then on top of that as well, I get it. Cool. This is sort of like the Joe Rogan um, idea behind COVID. Right? And I, I understand his point of view where like he says, oh, um, why don't the politicians talk more honestly about the risk of COVID for people who are morbidly obese and then of course promote more healthy um, lifestyle choices right in terms of you know education around dieting and what to eat and working out all this sort of stuff and nutrients to take and supplements yeah that's very very true but then it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that with all these issues we have in the UK with obesity right and the the strain that's been put on the health service it's just been released now that you know nurses are what they've got a three pound fifty bump in the budget that got announced the other day so for all this good work that they want to put forward initiatives and shit the people that are actually at the front line in terms of helping people who can't maybe help themselves aren't being compensated and then the people like myself who want to go and work out and lose weight can't go to gyms because they've been deemed to be a health hazard because of covid and shit but come on, man, come on. If you're going to do that, cool. But then open them at the same time as everything else. Why non-essential shops or, you know, or like I said, why be, why can we go to bars and pubs and have a drink with our friends, but we can't go and work out in the gym? That's the only annoying part about it, I think. In general, it's good for him. He looks healthy. He looks fit. He can be there for his family. All that good stuff. Bloody blah, blah, blah. He looks probably look better in a suit. Yeah, we get it. But allow us to go out then. Allow us, for good sake. 
Sometimes these people, man. No shame. No shame. Talking about no shame. Have you guys seen this this whole situation happening with well it's it's been resolved now but Lady Gaga's dogs were robbed right for from her dog walker um walking the dogs late at night um some hoodlums came around snatched the dogs off of him he didn't want to let go of the leash and so naturally they shot him four times in the chest luckily the guy is making a full recovery and then uh, lady gaga puts out a post basically offering half a million dollars for the safe return of her uh, precious dogs um the dogs are eventually found tied around the lamppost and everyone conveniently forgets about the guy that got shot four times in the chest he got shot not once not twice not thrice four times now don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not america so i don't know what kind of gun you get shot with four times in the chest and you don't instantly die because from what i know from playing call of duty if you aim at center mass it's lights out baby so i don't know how this guy survived he might have when they but maybe it's an american thing so when they say shooting it's like in america if you uh from what i've seen so far from the public freak out videos if a police officer tells you you're under arrest and you back away that's instantly resisting arrest so that's one charge if you then you know, struggle, then you it can be an ag aggravated arrest or something, right? Everything that you do that doesn't uh, that doesn't kind of equate to you complying to their every demand is essentially a charge on your rap sheet. So maybe when they say shot, it could mean anything. It could mean the gun discharge, but a bullet didn't come out. It could mean ricochet. It could mean shrapnel, whatever it could mean. But it just doesn't make any sense to me how someone that gets shot four times is alive. But thank God he is, right? The Lord above, his family are super happy that the guy's alive. But there's no mention of him. No one gives a, a scooby about him. Do you even know the guy's name? I beg you. I I'm sure you guys have probably seen the video. You've seen all the clips. You've heard him screaming for his life as he's lying on the floor and the car speeds away and some guy comes out and flip-flops and sort of casually just calls 911. But have you or do you know the guy's name? I'm sure you've seen his face, but do you know his name? It's insane. And this report basically drums home the lack of kind of humanity and the fact that really and truly no one gives a shit about you or I, do they? They don't care. We all care about ourselves. So Lady Gaga cares about her dogs. She went her dogs back. She put out a big reward. Um, she, she was on social every single day until those dogs were found. She eventually got them back. But in terms of humans, in terms of you and I, humans, human beings, right? No one gives a shit because this guy is laid up in the hospital posting paragraphs under his captions about his experience and no one's caring. And then when they're covering on the news, such as this clip here, it's a very <laughs> different way of presenting it. So let's play this. Next tonight, dogs returned. Lady Gaga's French Bulldogs found safe days after her dog walker was shot during an armed robbery. He is expected to make a full recovery. ABC's Zareen Shah with the latest on the investigation. Tonight, as the search continues for the men who shot Lady Gaga's dog walker and stole two of her beloved French bulldogs, LAPD confirming this afternoon an unidentified woman found the dogs tied to a pole Friday night, miles away from where they were kidnapped, and returned them to this LAPD station. This follows Wednesday's violent snatch operation, where two men shot dog walker Ryan Fisher in the chest four times. Okay, we heard his name once, once, All right? All captured on surveillance video obtained by TMZ. Gaga promised to pay $500,000 for Koji and Gustav's safe return. Koji and Gustav got $500 re reward, right? But nobody put out a reward to find out, the to find out who bloody shot the guy. Why? Is it because she was told not to by the police? Because essentially that's a bounty, right? You can't actually put a bounty on someone's head. But come on, surely you can put up some sort of you know, uh, reward for information leading up to the arrest of somebody. You don't want people to go out there and go oh, bounty hunter on somebody. But at least information, especially if a guy, for instance, if you care about your dogs this much, I would assume, right, that the person that walks them is probably a family member, right? They're not a friend anymore. They're not an employee. This person is like somebody that you will trust with your literal babies, right? And even though it makes me bath my mouth, people regard their pets as babies, but some people have that real close connection with their pets with their animals so it makes sense right the person looking after them is somebody that you really trust and they're involved in such a traumatic incident like this right shot in the chest not once not twice not thrice four times right and then you only offer up a cash reward for the dog safe return but nothing for the information of who shot your dog walker god almighty no one cares about you or i that's the message all right 
care about yourself and your family and your friends because really and truly no one cares no details on cute, if though. and how the woman would receive half a million and offer raising eyebrows when gaga tweeted it out you might encourage other people to do bad things for they've got a former fbi honestly bruv they've got a former fbi agent talking about the theft of two dogs on tv on tv right guys have got no health care over in the states the whole stimulus check thing has gone quiet right the democrats are in power now right the whole stimulus check two thousand pounds has gone out the window it's now 1400 right you just send, send flipping bombs and missiles over to syria huh huh people are flipping you know giving what the mr potato head you know uh making mr potato head flipping gender neutral or whatever it is giving it pronouns and uh, fbi agents on tv talking about two missing dogs holy shit or a reward um uh, or you're going to get an abundance of leads that probably are worthless because people are just basically trying to get the money Fisher's family, meanwhile, tells ABC he is still in the hospital recovering. They thank the staff and Lady Gaga for her love and concern. Love and concern. Wait. I'm glad those dogs are okay, Zareen. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> this feels like a bit. This feels like an onion article or something. This doesn't feel real. <laughs> like, you know, right? <laughs> She's also talking about the guy, right? Look, but listen, are listen, worthless listen. Because people are just basically trying listen. to get the money. She's talking about the guy, the victim. Fisher's family, meanwhile, tells ABC he is still in the hospital recovering. They thank the staff and Lady Gaga for her love and concern. Wit. I'm glad those dogs are okay, Zareen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck the guy. I'm glad the dogs are okay. Honestly, absolutely insane scenes, man. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. I love sometimes the, the kind of... Um, wafty sort of disconnectedness that some of these elite elite celebrities have right especially people on lady gaga's level the mariah carries of this world they don't operate on our frequency they're not even in the same universe as us they off they're, they're operating a whole different parallel universe something that doesn't you can't even comprehend in our brains do you know what i mean that's where they're existing day to day so these troubles, you know, dog walker got shown. Who cares, man? Get the dogs back. How much do they want? Okay, wire it through. Actually, here it is. It's in my pocket. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's mad, man. It's mad. It's mad. Oh, the dog dogs are okay though, isn't it? The dogs are okay. Bloody hell! Man. I swear to God. I swear to God. It's weird. Anyways, moving on. So interesting topic happened the other day. Um, I listened to a podcast called DJs and Beers. It's possibly, quite possibly, one of the best podcasts um, in terms of electronic music, dance music, club culture, DJ culture, techno, whatever it may be called, that exists. I used to really like listening to Resident Advisor at the Exchange, but ever since Resident Advisor went, you know, uh, down the pan, the Exchange has kind of turned a bit turned to a bit turned to shit kind of no don't get me wrong it's not really their fault because they've basically interviewed everybody right there's nothing left to say a lot of people in dance music don't really like to get in front of the microphone even on the podcast and speak about things sometimes you want to you know remain mysterious and mis have that kind of sense of mystique around them sometimes they don't really think what they say has any kind of relevance or weight they don't really think what they have to say is all that interesting they think what they're doing is pretty normal which it isn't it's flipping amazing that they get to produce these amazing tracks that end up being a soundtrack to our lives that end up being you know tracks that we can kind of place hold um you know various events that happen to us it can be tracks that sort of spearhead us into you know different careers tracks that sort of land, launch us to go into different avenues all these amazing things but you know they probably don't really think um that they can hold a conversation or say anything that interesting it's weird i don't know what it is but regardless there's not a lot of really good quality podcasts that exist out there talking with um, especially that are centered around people that are actually performing at an elite level within that space and DJs and beers is probably one of the only ones because it's all djs um who are speaking on there they invite various people from the scene um you know from bookers um to managers to fellow djs to producers to artists and they share loads of great war stories and i guess it's even 
I guess it's a better product now than it probably would have been if it, we weren't living in COVID because everyone's in a sort of nostalgic mood and they're all comparing notes from a career that they probably all maybe took a little bit for granted and they can't wait to get back on the road and on the stage doing what they love again. So they're sort of using the opportunity to kind of tell people, you know, the many different stories that they've kind of, you know, uh, collated over the many years. And this recent one that they had, I'm not sure what episode number it is, but just check it out. Um, it kind of features one of the guys that's involved with the booking that fabric and another dude who's um i've got to say heading up a booking or management agency um i think that's pr or something on those lines anyway along that topic they were speaking about fabric reopening and it's uh, kind of obviously great news for me being a club kid and also being somebody that's obsessed with going to you know various different places and being obsessed with uh you know engracing myself in the in the culture itself um but an interesting argument in terms of what happens now going forward with um fabric in terms of their approach to things right because if you're not familiar fabric is obviously one of our main clubs here in uk in london it's obviously got a um, very long and storied history within um dance music scene but it's gone through a little you know a, a few bumps along the road especially when they had to close due to that drug bus and unfortunate occasion when a couple of kids passed away due to being no, due to ingesting some drugs they probably shouldn't have taken or maybe they were sold some buff stuff but regardless of the issue they went regardless of the circumstances or what exactly happened um some very unfortunate circumstances led to the places you know abrupt closure then they had the whole licensing thing and it's kind of from the last time that i've been there it's not really i in my in my experience when i've been there it kind of felt like the weight of all those situations is weighing heavy on the club and it just felt like a really um weird place to party uh, from the security check to going in it's just a really strenuous experience it doesn't necessarily fill you with glee to go and dance on the dance floor it takes a lot for me to decide to kind of forego the other venues that we have here in london and directly focus my attention to going to fabric and quite honestly the lineups are pretty crap for the most part in my opinion um, obviously now they've kind of changed things and as the guy mentioned in the podcast digits and beers they're specifically trying to cultivate this residence play this residence roster where they can basically have a group of djs who are kind of you know on different uh, stages of their journey in terms of you know their djing career and have them playing various days along the weekend and then obviously uh supplement well having them play various days along the weekend and then obviously having some big headliners that come in who can then kind of pull a bit of a crowd but basically making sure most of their programming is centered around these residents which i think is great it's a lost art here in the uk we don't really have it for some reason i know why because you know the ticket prices and bars need to make money on the on, on the bar to kind of justify keeping a lights on in hiring security so more often than not they much prefer to have promoters come in do one of shows per month or you know bi-monthly book really big djs in who can command a good ticket price who can sell tickets most importantly because that is also something that um is probably on the front of everyone's mind when they're making events and that essentially then um re uh kind of pushes back the ability for resident advisors to have a career or to have any sort of way of slowly but surely working their way up the DJ circuit, which is why, in my experience, because I'm a DJ myself, I have found most of the people who are successful from my sort of like lower to middle tier, usually the best way to get kind of like to jump a few tiers or to kind of get yourself in the, in the in the right places is to befriend a certain promotion group befriend a production crew befriend a uh befriend, promotion befriend a, a club um get involved that way or, or even just set up your own club night that's the only way to kind of get yourself involved if you want to do the whole risen advisor the kind of esoteric not esoteric the kind of ideal way which you kind of see promoted in germany and and sometimes in places like Holland as well, where you have a, a set amount of people that play every weekend or on set days during the week, maybe a Thursday and a Friday, um, in places like Munich and shit. And then you know, then the, they get they get an understanding of the club, they get to develop their sound. The punters come in, they get an idea of what they play, blah blah blah. blah you get a connection, and obviously you kind of grow over time. That stuff doesn't really exist because of that. But obviously, through this conversation on the users and beers, that resident advisor Booker is basically saying that no, I want to change things. I want things to change for the better. And now they've just announced just the other day um, that res obviously Fabric is reopening for the weekend and it's looking like a pretty decent affair. So this is from uh, Friday, 25th of June. 
It says, as the world unlocks from the COVID restrictions, we are looking forward to welcoming artists and clubbers back as uh, 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 back um, at EC1 with a weekend-long celebration of the UK-based talent and residents blending house, techno, DMB, and more. So no DJs announced, zero lineup, put out the tickets, um, you know, back-to-back -back weekends, and just going for it. Do you know what I mean? And I think this is great. But I think for the future of club culture in the UK, especially in London, and for the kind of possibility for people like myself to maybe eventually get to a level where i'm playing like a headlining set somewhere in a club or i'm commanding a big stage somewhere on a festival this is the only option this is the only way things will change is if the industry allows their uh permits an option or a way for people like myself or people who are a bit higher than my higher than me especially the ones in the middle tier i feel more sorry for to basically able to do because you know if you're in the middle tier you most likely wouldn't have played these sort of places un unless covid happened unless we're brexit happened as well because you know the possibility for these places to go and fly in big headlining european acts kind of dwindles and then obviously that increases their demand in europe they end up charging more of a fee that then prices them out of maybe coming to the uk because of the visas and all that sort of shit so it's an advantageous moment and i'm just hoping now because again it's it's twofold it's not just it's threefold it's not even just the artists it's not even just the, the venues and the bookers and promoters it's up to us as well as punters to back these nights we have to go and vote with our feet because the unfortunate um reality of the situation is as much as people hate it those business techno people they sell tickets they move numbers right they command the fee that they are you know sometimes unfairly asked for especially during hard times i've heard of rumors of you know some very prominent techno business techno people refusing to lower their fees right because they're saying yeah it's a buyer's market right um there's not a lot of places open i'm a rare commodity i can actually move tickets so if you want me to play you have to pay my my fee and some to guarantee my um, appearance so you know some people are being you know as uh, cunty as you would expect them to be but there's a reason why they command that fee is because they can legitimately sell tickets um, and they can obviously pr uh, bring a crowd in that's going to buy drinks at a bar and not try and slip stuff in in their sock and shit. So that is a reason. So I guess it's up to us as punters and customers to kind of change the narrative. We'll obviously be hungry to go out now because we've all been locked indoors for flipping ages, but we need to go out and vote with our feet, attend these places, attend these raves that are happening over the next, you know, few weeks. Well, what, when July happens anyway. Well, yeah, July is it july it's july isn't it july or june sorry june 21st onwards we need to be the ones voting with our feet and in order to kind of push push it so that fabric have no other option but to continue this sort of thing because if this doesn't work you can't then complain if they go and book all the standard business techno people and put them on line because you know they know that works too um they know that works for sure anyway continues here while we're excited to reopen this will be a dependent on our confidence in being able to do it in safely under the government sanctioned covid protocols we'll do it if we can be sure um as of everything under covid the opening date may change as we follow the government scientific advice and on when to hold and when to open and if we have to push back the reopening tickets would be transferable or of course we fully refundable unfortunately we can't promise a refund of the booking fee cool and also that as well don't be a knob as well if you buy a ticket for an event especially um with these kind of tbc requirements kind of coming involved uh, don't be a prick and start demanding refunds and shit take the risk back the clubs if it doesn't happen hold on to the ticket don't don't refund it you're going to be able to use it sooner rather than later anyway when the world re does reopen, even if it's not exactly on June 21st. So buy at your own risk, but also don't be a knob. Um, it continues, as with everything on the COVID, the opening date may change. Duh, duh, duh. The love from all that been to entry at Fabric. So those tickets are going to go on sale, I think, according to their Instagram on the 5th. Oh, tomorrow. So it should be on sale. Yes, yeah, on tomorrow. Tomorrow is in tomorrow or tomorrow is in today seven hours ago i'm gonna say tomorrow's in today it's 5 p.m so definitely check out if you haven't purchased those already they're definitely going to be flying out even if they're 35 quid people are not going to give a shit um even if they're 50 quid they're not going to give a crap so definitely get involved but again i'm interested to see how this progresses forward i'm interested to see if this is going to be the method going forward if they're going to have we're going to have to rely on residents because the evidence so far suggests it's not going to happen everyone's kind of talking a big game and you know being all optimistic and less cynical as they probably would have been but from what we've seen of these playgraves most of these playgraves with the with the exception of maybe the possession parties they put together most of them contained either one more than one business techno kind of i mean yeah business techno kind of person like they didn't you know they i didn't see any 
other play grave happened even the illegal even the legal ones that didn't involve someone that has some sort of connection with the business tech or not so let's see i'm hoping for the best hoping for the best but you know you never know next on the list here uh, uh we have good news too um crank brothers are putting together a little party as well that's gonna be pretty decent uh crank brothers present shoreditch street party dixon playing for six hours man as you can see, I've already registered. It's on the, the 31st of July on a Saturday, so it gives them plenty of time to plan. If things get pushed back to, they've got a lot of room to kind of wiggle and shit. As you can see, this is usually where they host it. It's a little street off of Shoreditch that they basically cut off from everybody else and turn into a bit of an outdoor party. It's a pretty decent idea, to be fair. And probably the only... It's probably the kind of thing that Shoreditch want to promote more so than clubs and stuff because they're a bit you know, nervous about there being stabbings and stuff like that happening in that sort of area. But they'd much rather, stuff stuff like this and uh, things that you'd see in Box Park, they're super popular because they kind of welcome, you're able to kind of welcome a different sort of clientele than you would have maybe doing a club. Um, more varied, um, probably, uh, let's say, people with a lot more disposable income. Um, again, because it's a locked-in event, uh, it's all kind of self in self enclosed. You have people there selling food and shit, merch. It's a great way to kind of just clock up the extra bit of dweller in your little bank account if you're the promoter. But of course, you got necessary risk permits. Installing a sound system is a whole affair, but it's gonna be fucking awesome, especially in London summers. Imagine the, the heat bearing down on you outdoors. You know, pretending you smoke cigarettes, <laughs> drinking your flipping red stripe that's warm, right? Boom, 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 boom. It's going to be a vibe. It's going to be a vibe. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Next again. Uh, we have this. This is a funny headline, isn't it, right? From Mix Mag, of course. Uh, Mike Skinner, the absolute legend. The Streets released a new track called Who's Got the Bag, June 21st. <laughs> you know what they're talking about. You know the vibe here from Mix Mag. So the Streets have released a new single, hyping up the return to clubbing and sesh. Um, planned and to social contact on the 21st said who's got the bag june 21st mike skin's lyrics are an ode to the sesh culture and a return to club co uh, clubbing and pubs opening it says first in the room first thing for the noon um um what's that no let's say uh, first first in the room first in from noon herbalist fumes where's me balloon curse off the zoom definitely man oh bun zoom is on when we go back to real life um the chorus features a dirty bass line as skinner sings 21st of june and shouts who's got the bag who's got the bag other lyrics include tooting on the boris smoking on the rishi um the hers of the goons the blur of the perfume reverse up the tune birded off the zoo birded off too soon speaking last march skinner said it's not cool to be 40 in a nightclub getting off your face adding that it's very easy not to do that <laughs> and find a routine where he's a character and turmeric lattes every night rather than staying up madness um the long stretch of lockdown appears to have got his mind straight back in it that's true though that's true for everybody unfortunately even for the ones that were behaving this prolonged period of staying indoors has turned us all into flipping animals. I think everyone's going to have their period, right? Everyone's going to have their sort of like moment where you're going to want to go and rage. Then it's going to settle down. We all know it's going to settle down sooner rather than later. But we need, everyone needs a session. We need to just get it out of my system. And I've said to myself, no matter what happens, well, the first rave that I go to, preferably indoors, I'm going to be stone cold sober. I just want to enjoy it for everything. I want to, I want to have a, tactile experience i want to feel every single minutia of that experience from the standing outside and the chitter tatter of people in the queue to the getting frisked by security to the lovely dog girl or dog guy you meet whatever i want to feel and remember everything as i go outside so i'm going to be stone stone cold sober when i go i cannot wait man i honestly cannot wait um let's move on let's move on let's move on let's move on Ba, 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 ba. What else we got here? Let's move on for that one. We'll talk about it another time. We got this. We got that. 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 We got this. Okay, cool. We got this. So it's this courtesy of Royal College of Art. Good news for Virgil, and it keeps stacking up jobs, mate. Virgil might be the hardest working man in what in culture in general, right? Forget streetwear forget fashion 
just in terms of this thing that we call culture he might be the hardest working person man woman dog pet you know whatever he might be the hardest working person this is courtesy of resident uh, sorry royal college of art Vir virgil abloh pardon me to join royal college of art as a visiting professor right um this is that weird look he was going for during covid i wasn't really a fan of it right um you know shave off the eyebrows he he, he looks like a, he looked um yeah he, he didn't have a beard at that time but he shaved off everything he looked a bit like a droid didn't it um but yeah this is him there posing for the pic looking all arty so it says the following the Royal College of Art um, announced today that Virgil Abloh, American fashion designer, artist, architect, engineer, creative director, DJ and entrepreneur will join the Royal College as a visiting professor. And what's wild as well, right? Legitimately, legitimately, say what you want about the guy, fashion, whatever, you don't rate this, don't rate that. There's not a lot of people who can legitimately say that each of these things, right, could be a career. He could be a full-time designer if you wanted to, right? Um, what's that thing he's got? Um, uh, what's that thing called? Canary Yellow, right? Design studio thingy. He could could clearly be an artist if he wanted to. An architect, easy. Someone, you know, one of those hoteliers would easily pay Virgil money to flip and go out and open up different boutique hotels and uh, members clubs and uh, private estates and villas and shit. Like he could do that with his eyes closed. Engineer, you already know the vibes. Creative director, that was like the flipping. Do you remember people stop saying creative director now, right? That's sort of a term that's died. Maybe that culture, it sort of died too, right? It's not, it's not part of our lexicon anymore. Everyone was a creative director. Everyone kind of, that's basically, but I also don't mind it because it's basically, it's the best sort of um, title most people can have to describe the multitude of things that they do, especially if you're involved in stuff and you're part of things, right? If you've made a zine, if you've, you know done some photography you did a bit of writing um you've maybe done some modeling here and there uh you've put together a little capsule collection of clothes um you maybe dj'd at an after party or at a gallery exhibition whatever it's hard to put or you've put together a score for a fashion show it's difficult to encompass all of that in just conventional you know titles the easiest thing to do is maybe artistic director producer creative director right um what's the, what's the other one, cringy one dot connector or something like ugh. You feel disgusting, but you get it, right? Um, you can legitimately have a full time career in that DJing. I think if he wanted to, he could probably have a full time career in doing that too. It wouldn't probably be the most lucrative occupation, but it he'd be able to do it. An entrepreneur, yeah, easy, simple. It's maddening, isn't it? That this guy that any and he just willingly takes up more jobs because he just wants to and it just wants to keep operating at that high frequency. And that's the thing as well, I think, which is interesting about his approach because it, it reminds me a little bit. Of this quote of this clip i saw of brendan schaub on um what was he on he was on the honeydew podcast right he was talking about um how he had works hard and his work ethic in comedy and i think that's true i think if legitimately say what you want about brendan schaub he definitely does strike me as somebody that works really hard so he gets up on stage all the time every other week you know i don't think there's a weekend that's gone by in the entire time during covid maybe apart from the time he was sick and he had to quarantine where Brendan Schaub has ever not been on stage, right? He's been touring the entire time. That might be just a consequence. That might just be a necessity thing, right? I think sometimes people like Virgil as well, they have that tendency where because you like to live a certain... Um, you would like to you like you like to you want to have a certain quality of life so that in order to maintain it you have to just keep hustling so it kind of gives you a reason to get up in, uh, get up get up from bed in the morning but i think someone like him is similar to carl lagerford where like it's just an internal thing it's not even a thing because they've got bills to pay or whatever a car note to keep on i just think it's just one of those things even if he wasn't designing at this level he'd still be doing a million projects but i also think it's interesting that sometimes hard work isn't enough right sometimes you can work as hard as you want but if you haven't got the talent or the ability to maybe synthesize what's happening in culture and sort of like put it on something and produce something right and make it work and connect with people whatever it may be it just isn't gonna work like and also i think on the other side of the coin i also think people really underestimate what hard work actually means so people say oh i work hard i work hard no no what do you actually do day to day hour to hour that actually constitutes as hard work out how many days how many hours in a day are you spending on that thing that you actually want to pursue like and sometimes you know people really you tally up and you realize why wow, you're not really working that hard you may think you are because you're thinking about stuff and you think you have this intrinsic ability inside of you to do things and i'm only saying that because i know i've done it and in the moment you start actually doing the thing that you want to do you start to realizing oh this is what hard work actually means it means just doing this 
times 10 all the time without stopping right and it's really difficult to do especially at that level because this guy again like i said he could easily rest on his laurels just become a dj just just do his fashion like if you wanted to you could probably make a flipping killing just doing off-white full time right just imagine and he's still purposely doing all these things it's flipping insane it really really is um it continues. Uh, this is the article. It says, uh, Virgil's appointment as a visiting professor at RCA will enable students from across the college to benefit from his wealth of experience as a leading figure in international fashion and design. He'll present a masterclass and talks throughout the year, as well as share unique employment opportunities with our student alumni. That is insane. That's so cool. That is so fucking cool. Wow. Internships available. Positions are available paid jobs and shit and again that's the thing you have to you have to say about this guy honestly like he has done some questionable sus things here and there but you know we all make mistakes we all do things so far he's corrected them very well and also forget all that right let's just say he makes these mistakes and doesn't even correct them just as a guy he might be the greatest friend to have in the history of the world isn't it everyone that stands next to this guy is essentially close to a millionaire everybody Everybody has their own thing going on, right? From the guy that does the cars to Heron Preston to to flipping um, who else? Uh, Matthew Williams, uh, maybe Jerry Lorenzo a little bit. You could say maybe that's more of a Kanye thing to Jown, Jordan Sanders, who maybe you could say he was doing his thing anyway, but still, I'd say the platform got boosted by him. Even fucking Benji B probably got another signal boost from him. Like, everyone gets something from standing next to him because he kind of empowers you. The photographer that he's worked with that do all the documentaries for his fashion show, the models definitely get a, a boost in profile. Like, everyone... Like, he gives everyone an opportunity. Like, it's literally everyone gets a chance to blow up and do their own thing. Like, it's absolutely mad. So, to think that this guy is giving you, students, the opportunity to work alongside him or stuff that he's done or other people next to him, blah, 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 is mad. Mad, mad, mad. And definitely something that I didn't get when I went to university, bro. This wasn't, this wasn't an opportunity when I went. Central St. Martin's good. Oh, that place, man. Oh, that place. I have stories at Central St. Martin's. I have stories. And it continues. Uh, Virgil said, it is a great honor I joined RCA as a visiting professor to reinforce the importance of education and the hands-on mentorship of future generations. Sir Johnny Ive, RCA Chancellor. Johnny Ive is even getting in the place. God damn, what a cosign. He said, Virgil is a true force of change and a powerful combination of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit who's experience of mentorship will undoubtedly inspire a new generation of creative innovators to realize the full value of their potential and thrilled that he's agreed to help us to move our work at the college uh, zoe broach rca head of fashion said virgin bodies the rca spirit of collaboration and intuitivity ingu ingu ingenuity sorry he is a designer and poly and poly polymathic polymath polymath polymathic polymathic entrepreneur who has combined the fields of art, architecture, craft, and design. Ultimately, the way he uses his practice to create social change is inspiring. Uh, I hate the term practice. I hate the term works. Ugh. Um, Virgil has been artistic director of Louis Vuitton menswear a collection since March 2018. He is the first African-American to hold a position since, um, at the Maison. He's also the founder and CEO of Miller & Base, label Off-White, a fashion house he founded in 2013. The, throughout his career, he has collaborated with numerous people, Ikea, Barbara Moa, Kanye West, conceptual artist Jenny Holzer, Japanese artist, uh, sorry, Japanese artist Takeshi Murakami. Virgil is passionate about the philanthropy and having recently created a fund to foster equity and inclusion within the fashion industry by providing scholarship and students of academic purpose, promissory, black African-American and uh, African descent in summer 2020. Virgil presented an inspiring talk at the RCA content lecture of potential solutions, ideas on race, of art and design and culture based on experiences, which is a highlight of many students studying an uncertain time. Like, honestly, man, so cool, man. Like, honestly, the, the guy deserves his props. Honestly, he does deserve his props. Like, no one no one really on, on his level is doing it like this. The good thing about it is, I think, because he's such a good guy to people and he's obviously giving everyone opportunities, it kind of forces and puts people in an awkward position where they sort of have to reach back as well. I think there's a lot more wankers in the scene, but because Virgil's around, he kind of brings out the best in people in terms of, like, you know, um, who they promote, who they co-sign and shit. I don't, I think if he wasn't around, there'd be a lot more scumbagging that's going on. So definitely he's a force for good. Um, he's a net positive, I'm going to say. That's what I'm saying. He's a net positive for sure. So big up Virgil for doing that. And if you're a student, definitely get involved. 
Next on the list. Oh, did you get did you get a pair? Did you get a pair of the Supreme Nike Dunk Lows? I didn't. I didn't. I'm sure you guys didn't get a pair either, but god damn it. They what what an incident. They sold out super quick, went out in record time. But it's interesting that they decided to kind of take this um design. When did it come out originally? 2003, right? Was the Dunk Highs 2003 without the stuffed tongue? Um and I think they were just in blue. Is it blue, red and black? Is it blue, red and black? Is it free color? I'm not sure. But anyway, regardless, um, I was never really a big fan of them. I didn't really see the hype, to be honest. The stars and the thing, I get it. I quite like the lows, to be fair. I think this green colorway is flipping beautiful. From what I've heard so far, the other three colorways, the navy, the black, and the red. Oh, sorry, and the maroon, the brown. Or brown, the brown, maroon, whatever the color is. What does it say here on the actual screen? Da, 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 da. it doesn't say anything it doesn't matter does it say when you hover across it no it doesn't but regardless supposedly one of these colors is uh supreme exclusive so i'm assuming it's this lime colorway and then the rest of them are going to be available on the sneakers app allegedly that's what people are saying um stock was pretty high but again hard to get a hold of now my put now my thinking is what i've been ruminating why is not why are supreme going in their archives and kind of risk you know uh, reviving a shoe that they done you know many years ago when usually they're sort of known for being the company who takes real chances with the nike collaborations when they don't need to supreme could easily make big bank right and be you know and sell out instantly all the time if they just took like you know classic easily already done silhouettes and just plastered the supreme logo over it we still haven't got a supreme jordan one yet right and that's i think on the horizon so far we've heard rumors about it but we haven't got a supreme jordan four yet really classic designs that they could easily make a killing on but they haven't done it so far and i'm really curious as to why they haven't and also curious as to why they're doing this now is this a consequence of them being bought out by that massive investment company and they need to hit some certain sales numbers so a great way to do that and to kind of i wouldn't say fudge the numbers but you know help for kind of in, in order to kind of make sure you're presenting um the numbers as gr in order to make sure that the numbers are as high as they can be the best way to, you know to go back into the archives release your greatest hits in a, you know in an updated silhouette you know taking you know kind of uh, jumping on this whole dunk revival especially with the dunk low sbs that have been you know absolutely you know all over the place and maybe not on everyone's feet that's a weird thing too right for all this hype of dunk sbs when is the last time you've actually seen someone in real life wearing a pair especially the limited not the ones that you can get easily but the ones that everyone wants right from the travises um to the ones with the silver and the swoosh you've got the name of them that came out from a skate store like when's the last time you see somebody actually wearing them day to day i've not seen i've seen maybe two maybe i've seen a couple people wear the travises right some foreign chinese students that live around my area um who are kind of really involved in the culture and you see them they're always dripping head to toe with um various stuffs and stuff whatever but regular people regular folk that you would imagine you know not seen it so far so it's really interesting that they decided to you know re-release the the classics the hits but one of my favorite pairs <clears throat> which i think was overlooked was this supreme nike trainer tw2 um <clears throat> easily one of my favorite pairs one easily um i regret selling my pair i had a black and i had the red um I'm a really big fan. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm a real big fan of air trainers. I think that whole division of shoes, the kind of, you know, the first sort of like dabbling of Nike where they kind of went into the cross training idea, taking inspiration from tennis shoes, shoes that could be worn on various different, you know, in various different aspects, whether you're on the court, whether you're in the gym, running, whatever it may be. It's like a kind of all encompassing shoe that could work in different sort of needs. And when they re-updated them, unfortunately, when they retroed them, they weren't anything close to the original. They were really boxy, really clunky looking. All the details that made the originals really unique were sort of kind of uh, cut corners on on these. And they didn't really turn out to be as good as they could have been. Uh, but in terms of an overall design and in terms of an option for Supreme to take, this was definitely a risk. And if I remember correctly, they were pretty easily available. Um, maybe the only colorway that did remotely good i think was maybe the white and the black but everything else especially and the blue but everything else was fairly easy to get a hold of and again um the clothing was pretty decent as well but i'm just bummed that it didn't give the shoe justice and if you're wondering why i had the original pair of these vintage that i ended up selling um because they were too small they looked kind of like this and i ended up selling them and they, i think i ended up wearing them on my bike and i kind of actually if you might if you have them you probably have my pair because i i wore them a couple of times but my pair had a little tear on the back because i was cycling 
And um, as I was cycling, my, uh, my foot slipped and the back of the shoe ripped um, on the kind of, you know, on the pedals. It's got the little spikes on it. So that ripped it. So if you've got a pair of these Air Trainer TW2s, um, the OG pairs from the 80s, and you have a little tear on the back of the heel, then definitely you've got my pair. Especially if they're, I think they're a size 10 or a size nine and a half. You definitely have my shoe. Oh, and actually the sole, the midsole might be broken. My, I think I remember that's why I also sold it. So um, I end up still getting a hefty resell on them as well, man. But I regret selling all my OGs, man. I had so many good vintage shoes I end up getting rid of. That was when I was kind of doing my whole like, fuck night, nah, yeah. You know, being a bit of a rebel. Uh, <laughs> now I just want all my shoes back. It's still fuck night, nah, don't get me wrong. But I just want my shoes back. Do you know what I mean? I want to buy them all back. But no one's got them for sale because, you know, they just disappeared and shit. Um, but they were really good, man. Easy one of my favorite pairs um but yeah i don't know did you get a pair of supreme nike dunks let me know in the comments down below if you got a pair i'd love to know you your thoughts what else do we have here we have other news from hype beast the nike air bacons are coming back they're back to celebrate air max day um the original one of the maybe one of the first sort of like limited edition air maxes i remember from back in the day this was maybe early 2000s, isn't it? This might have been just before the London Dunks, you know, originally. Yeah, yeah, 2004. That was before the the Dunks, the London Dunk SBs, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. Anyway, courtesy of Hype Beast, it says, ahead of the Air Max Day 2021, Nike has officially announced the release of the Dave's Quality Meats. Right, you remember that, show? Sure? You remember that store? Um, the bacon from 2004. Originally created in partnership with Dave Ortiz and Chris Keith, now shuttered Dave's Quality Meat. They're inspired by the various hues of the strip of bacon. That might have been one of easily one of the. You know, everyone's everyone's sort of losing their shit over the new Kif store. How it's super opulent and it's crazy. You had the, you know, have this amazing store in Paris that's basically selling hoodies and shit. But if you remember back in the day, streetwear stores used to be fucking so cool and interesting do you remember who was that guy that had that store that is it johnny cupcakes right he's kind of straight where jason he's more of a friend of uh, bobby hundreds and shit he had that store in 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 covent garden that was basically like a bakery but they, it was it was a t-shirt brand and it was all sort of like laid out that way merchandise in that way it kind of come in a bake and in a donut box and stuff like it was really cool concept and then you had dave's quality meat in new york where it was essentially a butcher's that was instead a streetwear store too. Like really great concepts that people had for their stores. Um, but nowadays, everything's sort of really formulaic. Loads of glass, loads of metal, stainless steel everywhere. Everything sort of looks the same. Um, but the concepts for streetwear stores back in the day were fairly, fairly interesting. Even the original hideout was, was cool. The original Bape store with the massive perspex sort of like glass things that they put the, uh, the t-shirts in. And you sort of would kind of look at them that way. Like those were fucking cool. Um, it continues here. Uh, the, 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 the retro mix marks his first re release in 17 years. Um, sell and straw are the two primary colorways. But look at that, man. They've even packaged it in this amazing little uh, packaging, similar to um, you getting a piece of bacon, obviously, from a butcher's. Like, look at it. It looks fucking cool, isn't it? Really, really cool. Even the laces are stuck that way. It looks amazing, man. Really, really cool. So definitely check them out. And you know what I like? And you can tell it's an actual streetwear store that put this together. A little detail that most people don't do with their product shots that makes me angry. Look at the laces. They lace them properly. They lace them properly for once because it's not a stock pick from Nike. Nike make all this money with shoes and shit and they can't relace shoes for product pictures. It drives me nuts. But look at them. Relaced. Right? Over, under. Right? Over, under on the on left pair. And then look at that on the right pair. The same thing. Lovely. If anything, to be a little bit pedantic, I'd say, yeah, there is. It's perfect. Yeah, that's the instep. So it's over under on there because when you, oh no, sneaker head flip, but when you're lacing a shoe, the this bit right needs to go over. But if it's on the left hand side, that needs to be the one that goes over, and then on the right hand side, that the, the the other shoe. You know what I mean? So it's like that way. That's how you basically do it. But look at it. It looks flipping beautiful. I can't wait for these to come out. When they're meant to come out, they're meant to come out um, on Nike Air Max Day, which is March 26th. So at the ready on the sneakers app. Now that kid from West Coast Streetwear is gone, it might give us an opportunity to get a pair. I doubt it, but it might improve our chances. March 26th, RRP of $120, $140, sorry, available on the sneakers app. Get involved. Let's see if we can get a situation. If we can't, off to China we go. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> ho,
People can be so mad with that shit. They get so angry when you when you bring up reps in it. Like, fuck, like, come on, man. What do you expect me to do? Like, you know what I mean? Get battle with these little kids to buy flipping trainers. Like, nah, allow it. If I've got the money and I can get it, rep bam. Wait, the hashtag, right? Is that the hashtag? Right? Oh, mate. Anyway, let's move on from that. Um, but yeah. Actually, you know what? That's it. Let's end it from there. Let's end it from there. Let's end it there. So... That was the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 389. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. 389 or 387 I don't know, whatever episode it is, thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. And I'll see you guys again very soon. But again, if you're checking out your YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe. If you listen to the podcast, please give me a five-star review and download the show. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care, be safe, and peace.